Good morning. Do I have anybody here with me? Good morning. <laughs> are, we, are we all sleepy still? Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Eva. Say good morning to the world, Eva. Here we are. Today is Wednesday, April 3rd, 2019. And today we are going to comment on the Gospel of St. John, chapter 5, verses 17 to 30. This is a long gospel, and we're not going to read everything about it. You're going to hear it at Mass today. Um, and this is also uh, a kind of gospel that is uh, clothed with plenty of mystery. St. John is, is a great mystic. So the way he writes things uh, and, and writes about what Jesus has said and done is also um, quite um, uh, clothed in mystery. So um, it may not be very easy to understand, but we will try to draw some practical uh, lessons for us today so that we could uh, put into practice a little bit of what the gospel so richly conveys uh, for us to consider today. So the context, the context of this gospel for today's Mass is very much related to the events that are about to happen in Holy Week. Okay, What are those events? What events are we commemorating this whole Lenten season? The passion of Jesus, right? The coming, the, the coming passion, death, again, okay? crucifixion of Jesus uh, on Good Friday. And uh, as we are walking through this path of Lent, Jesus is preparing us. Jesus is preparing us to understand the, the big mystery of, uh, of uh, his passion and death. Okay? Um, he's helping us to understand why um, he needed to go through this kind of an ordeal in his life, despite the fact that he is God and that he can do anything and that he can also wipe out his enemies, uh, you know, if he will to do that. Uh, but he doesn't do that. Um, and uh, instead, he's trying to make us understand that his impending crucifixion that we are going to commemorate soon is actually part of the grand design of God the Father. Okay, The grand design of the Blessed Trinity as far as the salvation of mankind is concerned. That the Son of Man, as Jesus called himself and referred to himself, right? the Son of Man has to suffer and to die to redeem mankind. Uh oh, God bless you. And our Lord says that uh, this is this is something that is not his own doing alone. Okay? That this is very much in conjunction with the will of the Father, in conjunction with what God the Father had made him do. Okay? And he says Amen, amen, I say to you, the Son cannot do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. For what he does, the Son will also do. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, so that you may be amazed. Okay? So our Lord is telling his disciples that really uh, the Father and I are one. Okay? As he has also said in another uh, passage, the Father and I are one. This shows us the intimacy of the Blessed Trinity. See, Jesus is here uh, partly revealing to us uh, the, the Blessed Trinity, that there is intimacy, that there is unity of wills, that there is oneness okay, between the Father, the Son, and later on he's going to talk about the third person, which is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, right? So that comprises the Blessed Trinity. But here in this Gospel, our Lord is talking about the intimate union between the Father and the Son. 
that the son does only what he sees the father doing that the son follows only what the father does to a certain extent even if uh, um, Jesus says that there is that unity that there's that oneness between the father and the son right there still is an implication of subordination right Jesus still implies here that he somehow subordinates his will to that of the father hey, it's it's a mystery that they are one right they are one the blessed trinity is is one but there's a hierarchy because there is a father the son and then there is the holy spirit okay so it's it's a mystery for us to understand that completely but our lord gives us a hint that despite that unity there seems to be some relationship of subordination that the, the son only does what the father wills that the son does what what the father does okay and and furthermore down our lord says i cannot do anything on my own i judge as i hear and my judgment is just because i do not seek my own will but the will of the one who sent me and who is that one who sent him excuse me it's the father it's god the father okay now so our lord seems to demonstrate for us the virtue of obedience okay that even if he is god and he is really equal to the father well he he seems to imply that he still he still uh, subordinates his own will to the will of the father so there is obedience there that he is demonstrating for us now uh, what would be the practical consequence of this particular gospel commentary uh, or, or reading today for our own lives for our own practical consideration in our daily lives i'd like to think this gospel today gives us a model of our relationship with our parents it gives us a model of how we uh, have to relate with our own parents okay that uh, that despite <clears throat> the the union between father and son there is subordination involved there is obedience involved okay and the same thing is true in any family in any family you have parents you have, oh, what happened there? What happened? Did it just disappear? Oh, what happened? Something happened. <laughs> okay, I don't know what happened. Uh oh. <clears throat> hey, what happened, Eva? What happened to you? Yeah. What did you do? Okay. Anyway, <laughs> something weird happened here. Okay. To the phone. Okay. Anyway, we'll continue. We'll continue with a commentary and hopefully it corrects itself later. If not, then sorry, folks. We got technical difficulties. Maybe if you can hear the audio, that'll be good enough. Okay. As I was saying, we have a model for parents and children to emulate here okay and what is that well that we share intimacy with our own parents we may be very intimate with our own parents right we may be uh, um, sharing a bond of friendship with our parents but at the same time there has to be subordination there has to be obedience there has to be submission of wills because that is the only way that we can learn from what our parents do okay as, a, as our lord himself says here he only does what he sees the father doing okay and that is the best way to learn right the best way to learn is for us to emulate the good example of our parents that's how children should be they follow the good example of their parents 
rather, the example of their parents, whether it be good or bad, right? That is why for us parents, I really don't know why I'm sideways. You know? How am I going to correct this? Maybe I'm going to go like that. Okay, anyway. For us parents, we have an obligation towards our children to give good example. So it's a very, very tough um, um, obligation because we have to be constantly on our toes because our children are watching. Our children are listening to our every conversation, to every word that comes out from us. Um, our children are witnessing all our actions. And so if we are to stand as good parents before them and give them uh, any lesson at all in life, they better be <coughs> learning through our good example. So um, we parents have a very, very big obligation um, to show good example for our children. And that is why, to me, that's the harder part of parenting. It's not so much the engendering of children and the welcoming of life that, uh, that our Lord, uh, that God wants to uh, give our families. Uh, to me, the bigger challenge of parenting is really how to be consistently giving good example to our children so that our children uh, can see God in us and can see the ways of God in us. When they see what we're doing, when they see how we're living our lives, hopefully they would emulate that and hopefully they would model their own lives after ours. So we parents have a very, very big obligation towards our children in this way. And you children, eh? you children, well, you can imitate the example of Jesus here who says that, well, I only do what my father wants me to do. Eh? I do not do my own will. I do not go about trying to assert myself. I do not try to go about the world trying to do what I like to do. Because in your own inexperience of life, you really don't know what you're doing most of the time. You really don't know what's good and bad for you most of the time. That is why you have to obey. That is why one of the biggest things I always keep on insisting on everybody is just to obey. <laughs> obey, 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 obey. Right? Because that is the most uh, 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 important, uh, I wouldn't say it's the most important virtue, but for you children at this stage of your lives, it may very well be the most important virtue to practice. Because it is the virtue that is very much connected to learning about the lessons of life. Learning about how you will conduct yourselves in this world. And how you are going to go through the path of sanctity that you are all being called to live. So obedience is a very, very important virtue. And you can see, if our Lord himself, being God already, submits himself, submits his own will to the will of the Father, then who are we not to obey? Who are we right? not to obey our parents? So I'd like you to think about that, especially this time of Lent. This time of Lent is a very, very good time to practice this virtue, especially if it's difficult for you. It's a good time to put this virtue into practice. Okay, folks, I don't know. I'm sideways here, so I don't know how this is going to turn out in the actual uh, video. But that's the end of us for today. Hope to see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Now this one finish. Ay ay ay. What happened there now? It got stuck. It doesn't want to end. Uh,